The 28th session of the Senate in the second regular session of the 16th Congress is hereby called to order. Let us all rise and for a minute of silent prayer. Thank you. With the permission of the chamber, the chair uh, suspends the session for one minute. The session is resumed. The secretary will please call the roll. Yeah. 
roll call of members. The Honorable Senators Angara Aquino Binay Cayetano Alan Peter Compañero S Cayetano Pia S Defensor Santiago Ejercito Enrile Scudero Strada Gingona Hunasan Lapid Legarda Marcos Usmeña Pimentel Po Recto Revilla Soto Trillanes Villar Senate President Drilon. Fourteen senators are present. The chair declares the presence of a quorum. The majority leader. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Mr. President, with the consent of the Senate, I move that we dispense with the reading of the journal of the 27th session, October 21, 2014, and consider the same as approved. Is there any objection? The chair hears none. The reading of the journal of session number 27 on Tuesday, October 21, 2014, is dispensed with. And the same is hereby approved. Mr. President, may we recognize and welcome to the Senate Bulacan Agricultural State College Student Council, led by their president, uh, Rogelio Valienta Jr. May we ask them to rise to be um, recognized? The students of Bulacan Agricultural State College, are they in the hall? Mr. President, we also have the Barangay officials of Barangay 743 Malate, Manila, led by Barangay Captain Philemon Tutika, Jr. Welcome to the Senate. We have members of the Synchronized Swimming Philippines, led by Coach Reina Rose Suarez. We welcome our visitors to the Senate. Uh, students of the Organizational Communication, Communication from UP Manila with Professor Myra Rondaris and Ms. Uh, Mylene. The students from UP Manila, BA Organizational Communication, headed by Professor Mayr. And we have students from the Trinity, Uni Trinity University of Asia, College of Medical Technology, headed by Luis Angelo B. Louis Angelo B. De La Cruz and Professor Red Marian Valera. The students from the Trinity University of Asia, College of Medical Technology, <laughs> are, welcome, are, pre are, are welcome to the side. Sir President, um, we also have uh, Congresswoman Maria Lourdes Acosta, Alba, uh, first district uh, from the first district of Bukidnon. Our colleague from the House of Representatives, Maria Lourdes Acosta, Alba. Together with her, our vice. Welcome to the Senate. Sorry, Mr. And President. And the local officials of the municipality of Talakag, yes. uh, Bukidnon, led by Vice Mayor Factura and the councillors. Welcome to the Senate. And lastly, Mr. President, members of the NCIP, the Executive Director, Marlea uh, P. Munez, Carlos P. Walsen, Jr., Director, Office of Education, Culture, and Health, Reynaldo A. Dingal, Chief Information Officer, and Mary Grace P. Bowsen, Planning Officer, also here with us uh, today, Mr. President. The officials of the NCIP are welcome to the Senate. Sir President, Sir President, I ask that we, I move that we recognize Senator Cynthia Villar to speak on a matter of uh, public interest. Senator Cynthia Villar is recognized to, on, a, on, a, on a question of public interest. <laughs> Mr. President, I rise on a matter of personal and collective privilege on the occasion of the World Food Day, and I will talk on agroecology. Agro World experts on agriculture and food have recently been highlighting about agroecology in various venues or, or platforms. It has been a topic and subject of various symposiums seminars, researches, publication, and speeches. They see it as an idea or concept whose time for adoption or implementation worldwide has come or long overdue even. In fact, just last month, on September 18 and 19, an international symposium on ecology for food security and nutrition was held facilitated by the Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, at its headquarters in Rome. 
It also raised awareness about agroecology. Discussions focus on the numerous economic, environmental, and social aspects encompasses. You see, agroecological concepts and practices contribute to the three main goals of the Food Administration Organization. One, in eradicating hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Second, in eliminating poverty and the driving forward of economic and social progress for all. And, the, and number three, sustainable management and utilization of natural resources, including land, water, air, and climate, for the benefit of present and future generations. Goals that we all here share as well, and goals that FAO believes will be realized and met with the help of agroecology. So as chairperson of the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food, I would like to present my own points and ideas about agroecology so that we can all weigh its benefits and promote its adoption and active implementation here in the agricultural country of ours. So what is agroecology? Agroecology uses ecological concepts and principles to design and manage sustainable agroecosystems, offering benefits for productivity, food security, environmental, sustainability and important ecosystem services such as climate change mitigation. What can agroecology offer? First and foremost, agroecology provides a number of environment-related benefits since it aims for environmental sustainability. If only for those benefits, agroecology is indeed very timely as an alternative to conventional farming, taking into consideration that the country now experience extreme weather disturbances such as stronger typhoons, droughts, El Nino, La Nina, and other environmental risks. Thus, we need different approaches such as agroecology. FAO Director General Jose Graciano da Silva said, a paradigm shift in agriculture is needed. He said that the main challenge facing the world farming is to lower the use of agricultural inputs, especially water and chemicals, as well as to make food production viable in the long term. He also cited agroecology as having the potential to reframe farming in a more sustainable way. Sustainability is the key. This is seconded by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Professor Hilal Elver, who cited that recent scientific researches increasingly prove how agroecology offers far more environmental sustainable methods that can still meet the rapidly growing demand for food. Based on estimates, there is a need to increase food production by over 60% to meet the expected demand from a population of over 9 billion in 2050. Ensuring food security is another factor that is of foremost consideration, and only small farmers and agroecology can feed the world. As UN itself acknowledged, according to FAO, 70% of food we consume globally comes from small farmers. Based on official statistics, 1.5 billion of people globally are estimated to be involved in family farming in over 500 million small farms worldwide. Ang seguridad ng pagkain ng ating bansa at ng buong mundo ay nakasalalay sa mga maliliit na mga magsasaka. In fact, 2014 has been designated by the United Nations as the International Year of Family Farming. Family farmers are a cru crucial part of our efforts to reach sustainable food security. 
As such, we need to develop and implement specific policies, programs, and strategies. In the process of sustainably increasing production, addressing climate change, and building resilience, agroecology is providing benefits to small scale, small scale and family farmers in particular. Actually, at some extent, small scale and family farmers have been practicing agroecology without them knowing about the science and ecology of it. But now with increased interest and attention to agroecology, they are more aware and thousands more are practicing it and many are even partnering with scientists. Agroecology is also seen to also slow the trend towards increasing urbanization, which is placing stress on public services in urban areas where increasing concentration of population is observed, especially here in Metro Manila. Kaya po napakarami na nating flooding and traffic and siguro dapat nating encourage and rural farm farming para wag na pumunta sa Metro Manila yung ating mga kababayan sa probinsya. It would contribute to rural development. The resulting higher income in rural areas would contribute to the growth of the other sectors of the economy in the countryside. Scientists also support agroecology. This is, after all, an interdisciplinary science that derive insights from ecologists and agronomists as well as social scientists. In fact, about 70 scientists and scholars of sustainable agriculture and food systems sent an open letter to the Food and Agriculture Organization praising the UN organization for convening an international symposium on agroecology for food and nutrition security. Given the intensifying challenges posed by continued food insecurity, rural poverty, climate change, drought, and water scarcity, the scientists call for a solid commitment to agroecology from the international community. They are calling for a launch of a UN system-wide initiative on agroecology as the central strategy for addressing climate change. The initiative, they said, could form one of the pillars in the future work of the Committee on World Food Security. Most of the experts believe that agroecology is best suited for small-scale and family farmers. And while I cited earlier, they have been practicing it even before, there is a need to provide adequate incentives and technical assistance to support small-scale farmers as well as micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in the creation of local agroecological business models that can make appropriate inputs and technologies available to communities. Agroecologists will also have an effect on solving malnutrition, which is still prevalent in our country. The status of micronutrient malnutrition in our country is a cause for concern. To quote the FAO report, iron deficiency disorder or anemia is the most alarming of the micronutrient deficiencies affecting a considerable proportion of infants which is 56%, pregnant women, 50%, lactating women, 45%, and older male person, 49%. And the vitamin A status of the country is considered severe subclinical deficiency also. Moreover, the incidence of underweight, wasting, and stunting which was prevalent mostly among Filipino children before, has now become prevalent among Filipino adolescents and adults as well. 
according to FAO, about 4 million or 31% of the preschool population were found to be underweight for age, 3 million or 19% adolescents, and 5 million or 13% adults, including older persons, were found to be underweight and chronically energy deficient. In another side of the scale, obesity, which is of course closely linked to malnutrition, has increased in prevalence among Filipinos too. Underweight, uh, underweight, stunting, and obesity, needless to say, are the root causes of diseases, increases health risk, and reduces life expectancy. Expen expectancy. Potentially fatal conditions associated with obesity include type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, cancers, and gallbladder disease. Moreover, FAO said the cumulative cost of all non-communicable diseases for which obesity is a leading risk factor were estimated to be about $1.4 trillion in 2010. And its toll on the economy is just as alarming. FAO pegged at 3.5 trillion per year globally the economic cost of malnutrition due to lost productivity and direct health costs. Although hunger statistics are still rising worldwide, it is not anymore merely about feeding or getting fed, but to have the means to grow sufficient nutritionally and culturally accepted food. I personally advocate vegetable gardening in both urban and rural areas. Greenpeace Philippine calls it ecological agriculture. It supports biodiversity in farms and follows a holistic approach to easing malnutrition and nutrients deficiency, especially among pregnant women and children. It has been providing Filipinos with diverse, safe, and healthy sources of food. During the World Food Day, I pledge support to their initiatives to promote ecological agriculture because it empowers us to plant, grow, and harvest our own food that is clean, grow naturally, and free from synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. I have been an active advocate of urban gardening using compost from household waste as fertilizer. Bukod sa nakakasira ang mga ito sa fertility or quality ng agricultural soil at iba pang harmful effects nito sa environment, alam naman natin na ang synthetic or inorganic pesticide at fertilizers ay mahal at nagpapaliit sa income ng mga farmers. Ako mismo ay meron organic fertilizer making enterprises both sa rotary composters at vermicomposting sa aking home city ng Las Piñas. We build composting centers in all of our city's barangay to convert kitchen and garden waste into organic fertilizer that we distribute for free to farmers, especially vegetable farmers. Ang composting ay inlined with the National Organic Agriculture Program. It envisions the organic agriculture sector contributing to the overall agriculture growth and development of the country in terms of sustainability, competitiveness, and food security, where at least 5% of Philippine agricultural farm will be converted into organic by 2016. Sa pamamagitan ng vegetable gardening, magkakaroon ng easy access sa masustansyang pagkain ang mga Pilipino at maibsan lalo ang malnutrition. Batay sa 2008 Food Consumption Survey of the Food and Nutrition Research Institute, ang mga Pilipino ay pakonti ng pakonti ang kinakain na gulay sa loob ng isang araw. Nitong nakaraang tatlong dekada. Mula sa 145 grams ng gulay sa isang araw noong 1978, ang ating vegetable consumption ay bumaba sa 110 grams 
na lamang noong 2008. Ang Department of Health mismo ay pinopromote ang vegetable gar gardening sa mga Pilipino. Sa pamamagitan sa pagtatanim ng mga gulay sa ating mga bakuran, magkakaroon tayo ng sariling supply ng gulay at magkakaroon din tayo ng pagkakataon na kumita mula sa mga ganito. There are numerous challenges that hinder extension of policy support to help small-scale producers improve soil and water conditions to increase farm outputs, achieve local food security, and long-term ecosystem sustainability. Some of the identified sets of policy of support that are recommended are, at the national level, they include agricultural policies that incentivize recycling of biomass within the agro-ecosystem, agricultural investment and extension targeted specifically to help small-scale producers improve soil and water condition through agroecological practices, agricultural policies that incentivize in in situ water conservation, soil enhancement, organic tillage regimes, and microclimate management, water policies that incentivize reduction of gray-blue water footprint of agricultural and food systems, not only in crop selection and farming methods, but also in food processing and packaging as well. Trade, investment, and intellectual property light rights policies that protect indigenous and peasants' right to select, domesticate, breed, exchange, and use native species of crops and livestock varieties. Environmental and policies based on the precautionary principle that avoid reckless introduction of GMOs and other emerging technologies. Coordinated environmental and agricultural policies on biodiversity that ensure heterogeneity and diversity at the landscape and farm level. Agricultural, water, and energy policies that prioritize the use of natural resources such as land and water for food production, local energy security, and local water security. Pro-democratization policies that recognize women's central role in agricultural and food system, revitalize rural economies, minority cultures, as well as marginalized livelihood practices. Mr. President, the possibilities and benefits of agroecology are indeed wide-ranging and encompassing. Thus, we need to look even more closely on how to actively implement its concepts approaches and processes in the country. Let us not be left behind from this prom promising agricultural approach. To cite an agroecology report, the vision of agroecology combines the sciences of ecology and agronomy with the political economy of food production and consumption. This approach goes beyond improving the availability of food to also ensuring access and the achievement of the right to food, indeed. It should be the standard by which national agricultural strategies, food security plans, and foreign assistance programs are evaluated by the respective publics. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Villar. Senator Pia Cayetano is recognized. May I know the pleasure of... Yes, Mr. President, with the permission of the sponsor, I would like to ask some questions. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad to answer the question of our uh, senator from Taguig. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, um, let me... Um, I make my support known to the sponsor for the um, the the topic of her um, privileged speech. Um, not only do I extend my support, but I would also, um, in the course of my questions, I would also like to get clarity on uh, some of the policies that her honor 
is um, either supporting or is expecting the agencies to come up with so that we can also support the same. Um, specifically, Mr. President, uh, I would like to express my concern that um, on, on the data that Her Honor provided us, which is basically that the consumption of vegetables by the Filipinos are going down. This is yeah. something that um, <clears throat> I have always been um, personally interested in. Uh, number one, I'm a health advocate, and I have also chaired the Committee on Health for many years. And my concern has always been, and I don't think anyone will deny this, that as we urbanize, as we develop, the tendency is to go to become more um, dependent on uh, commercialized food products. And this is also the observation that Her Honor makes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh. So interestingly, Mr. President, um, in my most recent trip to Europe where His Honor, the, the Senate President and I both attended the Interparliamentary Union, interestingly though, there, there is a, I, I personally observe, and I think I have read enough articles to show that there is some support in the observation that the development of uh, many European countries are different from the U.S., such that as they become more developed, as they modernize, they, they then also have a very strong, um, they, they, there is a stronger move towards preserving what originally was their way of life, including yes. their way of eating yes. and their, their whole lifestyle. So they, um, they are very strong in preserving their industries, uh, including the baking sector, where they will pro you, you promote the use of um, um, whole, wholesome products. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to the bakeries, it's all fresh, no? Mm -hmm. So instead of, um, it, it is the nature of the, the local residents to go to a bakery or a small grocery, in our case, Palenque, mm -hmm. where everything is fresh. Yeah. But as we get modernized, you tend to see the opening of mega stores where you usually are looking for imported uh, vegetable products, which many don't realize have less nutrients, no? Because they are, first of all, produced in a manner that will make it look fresh, despite not being fresh anymore. So the appearance has already been doctored, so it looks better. And then if you analyze the nutritional content, uh, it being not seasonal, it is no longer as healthy as it is naturally meant to be. So if you go back to the practices of our elders, and, for, and even up to this date, no, it, it, is, an, it's a, it is a common... It is a natural inclination of a housewife or if you have somebody in your house doing your grocery uh, to veer towards those vegetables that are cheaper. And the reason why they are cheap is because they're seasonal. Yes. So, so we do not do ourselves a favor when we, when we focus on importing products that are not natural to our own soil and when we also force ourselves to produce products that may be natural to our soil, but are not natural for that particular time of the year. Mm -hmm. So these are just little pieces of um, information that I have gathered, which to my mind are extremely consistent with Her Honor's privileged speech. And so what I would like to know, because I would like to support it, is what um, does Her Honor want from us now as a, as a, as a Senate body? Um, will she be coming up with um, bills or, or are we just urging uh, the Department of Agriculture and maybe to, that, to a certain extent Department of Health, as she has already noted, is supportive of this? What can we do? And in terms of budget for the upcoming budget debates on the floor, I would like to know. First of all, we should uh, support uh, the organic farming. Okay. Okay, and there is a, a program there in the Department of Agriculture uh, and a legislation uh, about national organic farming. And Her and Honor will be sponsoring that soon? No, there or? is a legislation, but uh, I think the implementation is not what we want it to be. I guess not, uh, because uh, I haven't heard much about it. Yeah, I, I looked at the budget of the organic farming, and uh, they provided for... Uh, training, but they did not provide for equipment whereby okay. we can implement the training that we gathered from our training program. So that is one uh, uh, initiative. 
Another initiative would be to support the National Waste Management Program by which we convert uh, kitchen waste and garden waste into organic fertilizer okay. so that uh, it will be easier to have an organic farm. And then we have to support also the encouragement of uh, small, uh, rather family farms in the countryside because it is their belief that only in family farms can we achieve this agroecology because it is a, a ma more natural way of doing farming and it is the belief of FAO that the only way we can answer our future food needs in the world would be to uh, establish more family, family farms, farms. Okay. and uh, uh, and the practice of family farms to integrate their farming with the environment, okay? And of course, they believe also that if we can establish more family farms in the countryside, then we can uh, discourage the urbanization where people from the rural areas will go to the urban areas, which is happening now in Metro Manila and in, uh, in other cities of the Philippines, and they are stretching the facilities of the urban areas so that we are having so much traffic and flooding. I think we cannot accommodate anymore the uh, number of urban dwellers in our urban areas. And we should all encourage also urban gardening so that if something might happen in the future, there will be a big calamity, then the people from the urban areas may be food self-sufficient uh, by the availability of sufficient uh, food in their uh, community, in their garden. So these are more or less some of the practices of agroecology which we want to be implemented in the Philippines. Well, I appreciate um, her honors uh, itemizing this uh, for me because, um, I, as I said, I am extending my full support on all these specific measures mentioned, uh, whether on the floor in terms of um, uh, getting more budgetary support. Uh, if, if, for example, she mentioned um, the need for the equipment for organic farming. I will be happy to support. And in terms of um, awareness campaigns, like on the National Waste Management Program, um, I would like to put on record and for Her Honor's information. I think we worked on this before when I was a new senator and Her Honor was in Congress. Yes. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you are the, an author in, in Congress of the National Solid Waste Act or the Clean Water no. or all of the above. I think my husband, Senator Villa. Ah, okay. But you were active in the at some point in I'm one active, of the oversight committees. I'm active in my uh, district. In your district. In, in promoting... Uh, waste management. So maybe in, it was in that capacity that yes. we had discussed this many years ago because I yeah. just remember that I was a new senator then. Mm -hmm. And um, the good news is I do believe that uh, there is now much more awareness on waste management programs. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, and I may have put this on record in the Senate, and I'll put it on record again because I'm hoping there is a change now. Early on, and this is like eight years ago, when um, not by my initiative, but with my support, waste management was introduced in the village that I live in, there was an uproar from the residents because they found it beneath them or too uh, difficult to have to segregate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was quite shocked that uh, we have come to that point where we refuse to look, into the, look at the bigger picture and um, you know, have this attitude. But as I said, no, I'd like to believe that um, things have been, over the years, no, um, people have been become more conscious and aware of this because we now have an active segregation program in, uh, in the village. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see it more and more in the countryside. So I think yeah. we've moved forward, yeah. but I think national support can uh, still be improved. Mm -hmm. A lot of this has been successful through local efforts. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, not all of the communities have the resources. No? Some may have a very proactive mayor, but some may not. So I think the national government should also play a role in in making this more available, the information and the support systems. Would Her Honor uh, agree with that? I think uh, we should 
ask first those who are interested to do it. We yeah, should not it's waste that our time with those who are not agree. interested. I also agree. And uh, for those who are interested, we should really uh, support them with our machineries so they can do waste composting, especially in the public market where there I are agree. really many uh, kitchen and garden waste which we can convert into organic fertilizer. Well, I, I, um, I'm also happy to put on record that uh, during the days when, uh, when uh, the senators, uh, the legislators still had PIDAF, one of the projects I initiated was a um, waste management program in the city of Taguig, yeah. along with uh, my then, the then um, barangay captain of uh, Barangay the Fort, who was my brother. So mm -hmm. it is now a um, much sought after frequently visited by barangay councillors all over the country yes. to see what they have been able to do. And actually, the funds went more into training, yes. not any heavy-duty equipment. No, no. It was training people house to house to segregate. It was teaching people to discipline themselves to segregate the waste so that, as we know, the bulk of it can be recycled and reused. So they have their composting area, which is the highlight of the whole uh, area designated as the waste management facility and they have the recycling the mrf where they they do the uh, sorting of all the the um uh the accumulated um waste or, or um disposed um, materials from from the residential areas um just one more point mr president i mean i could go on and on because there are so many subtopics here of interest to me but just one more point i would like to highlight is the uh, association of uh, um, food security agroeconomics mm -hmm. and health mm -hmm. and um the the health experts tell us that one of the biggest health crises the world will face and that includes the, the Philippines, is diabetes. Mm -hmm. And that is because of our diet. And uh, this is directly related to the, the um, privileged speech of her honor because as we commercialize, I just use that term, no? as we commercialize our diet and veer away from wholesome, um, nutritious food, many children, many Filipinos, and it goes as young as uh, very young children are already being diagnosed with diabetes and uh, this condition leads to all sorts of other health conditions which will tax our resources as a, as, a, as a country so instead of us having productive Filipinos at the age of 30 or 45 we will be spending so much money on their rehabilitation and uh, uh, health care so again this is more reason why we must focus on this because the um the domino effect is is enormous on the lifestyle and the standard of life that we can offer the filipinos so i i end here mr president by just expressing my support and thanks for this uh topic i just want to inform the senator from taguig that we have now uh, uh what do you call it a pilot project with bifar to, uh, to uh, do uh, an urban garden, urban aqua organic garden. So it's a combination of uh, uh, taking care of fishes in a pond mm -hmm. and uh, building an organic uh, farm, uh, organic uh, garden beside it. And the organic, uh, the produce of the organic garden will be the one that will be fed to the fishes. That's and we will get our water from the rains. So uh, I hope we will be successful in that because our first uh, uh, project was not successful, was not sustainable. So we're doing another model. And I promised the senator from Taguig, if we're successful, then we will try to adapt it also in all the barangays and open spaces of Taguig. And this is, um, Her Honor, this is in Las Piñas? Yes. Okay, um, well, if I may, I, I was ending, but I have to make a reply. I'm very excited to see that. And yes, I do hope uh, um, Taguig will be one of the recipients because um, the Honorable Mayor of uh, Taguig City is, um, has also prioritized that. They also have a organic farm project ongoing. 
And um, in fact, it has reached the point where they are working with local chefs to produce yes. um, finished products using these uh, organic, um, these organic um, uh, produce of the land. But if I may just add into the record, uh, I have also explored this further and because I sit in um, the, I sit on the board of every uh, state college and university in the country, I have actually uh, tapped the Cavite State University to work with the city of Taguig. And this is available to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, Cavite State University's mandate is to work with uh, local communities to promote um, agriculture, organic farming, and the like. So for anyone interested, yeah. most of these um, local uh, agricultural colleges should be equipped to do the same yeah. wherever they are and to, to tailor make the programs to the resources of the local community. So I'm also looking forward to that, but I also hope that others would take advantage of the expertise that are not too far from them, no? Because yeah. I'm pleasantly surprised that many of our professors and um, um, faculty are, are very knowledgeable no? and have studied abroad and uh, in, in various universities within the country. And their knowledge should be tapped and used for this purpose. So again, I thank the sponsor for uh, the information and look forward to programs. Thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Villa, Senator Cayetano. The majority leader is recognized. Sir President, we, I move that we refer the committee and the interpolation to the, I, yeah. I, the, to refer the speech and the interpolation to the Committee on Agriculture and Food as the primary committee and the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources as the secondary committee. So referred. Sir President, I move that we proceed with the reference of business. The Secretary will read the reference of business. Resolutions, proposed Senate Resolution Number 958, Resolution Directing the Senate Committees on Climate Change, Environment and Natural Resources, and other proper Senate committees to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the viability of carbon dioxide markets in the country with the NNV of creating legislation towards this end. By Senator Lapid. Climate Change, Environment and Natural Resources. 959, commending the Department of Tourism for its effort that led to the Philippines being awarded as the destination of the year at the 5th Annual TTG Travel Awards on October 2, 2014 at the Sentara Grand and Bangkok Convention Center in Bangkok, Thailand by Senator Lapid. Rules. 960, directing the proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the reported proliferation of fake luncheon meat in the market by Senator Defensor Santiago. Uh, trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. 961, directing the proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the Food and Drug Administration report that certain herbal food supplements are being promoted and are misleading the public with therapeutic claims by Senator Defensor Santiago. Health, <coughs> Demography, Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. 962, directing the proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the report of an impending riot due to jail overcrowding in Bulacan by Senator Defensor Sanchago. Justice and Human Rights, Local Government. 963, directing a proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the report that the Department of Energy has no concrete solution for 2015 brownouts by Senator Defensor Sanchago. Energy. 964, directing the proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the report that murder and homicide incidents in the country claimed 10,000 lives from January to July this year by Senator Defensor Sanchak. Public order and dangerous drugs. 965, directing the proper Senate committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the reports that the Tacloban city government has only received 251.5 billion pesos out of the 20 billion pesos the city needs for the rehabilitation for, from the destruction caused by Super Typhoon Yolanda in November 2013 by Senator Defensor Sanchago. Local Government Finance. 966, directing the proper Senate Committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the report that some public-private projects are disadvantageous to the government by Senator Defensor Sanchago. Economic Affairs, Public Works. 967, resolution in directing the proper Senate Committee 
to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the proposed labor market's preparedness for deeper regional integration in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Economic Community by Senator Defensor Santiago. Labor, Employment, and Human Resources Development. 968, to rename the Senate Committee on Civil Service and Government Reorganization and expand its jurisdiction amending for the purpose, Section 13, Paragraph 31, Rule 10 of the Senate Rules, introduced by Senator Trillianes IV. Rules. 969, congratulating and commending Ayala Corporation for honoring the country by being this, this year's recipient of the prestigious IMD Lombard Odier Global Family Business Award presented during the 25th Summit of the Family Business Network International on October 16, 2014 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates by Senator Lapid. Rules. 970, directing the Committee on Agriculture and Food to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation to review the procurement, distribution, and monitoring framework of the National Food Authority with the end and view of improving, improving NFA's policies, procedures, and practices and stop smuggling, price manipulation, and ensure availability and affordability of rice to consumers by Senator Sinche Villar. Agriculture and Food. 971, congratulating and commending Daniel Kaluag for winning the gold medal in the men's BMX race event in 2014 Asian Games at Ichon, South Korea on October 1, 2014 by Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy Esbinay. Rules. 972, urging the Senate Committee on Health and Demography to conduct an inquiry regarding the Ebola virus and the Department of Health's capability and preparedness in the event that said virus reaches Philippine territory with objectives of formulating preventive and contingency measures to address possible cases of Ebola virus in the country introduced by Senator Grace Paul. Health and Demography. 973, directing the proper Senate Committee to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation to determine the preparedness of the Philippine government on the detection, prevention, minimization, treatments, and containment measures of the Ebola virus disease and the capacity of our health workers and professionals to handle said disease by Senator Joseph Victor Ercet. Health and Demography. 974, directing the Committee on Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship and other appropriate Senate committees to conduct an investigation in aid of legislation on the proliferation of tax scams that defraud consumers and inquire on the measures being undertaken by appropriate government agencies and private telecommunication companies to put a stop to this unlawful activity by Senator Sincha A. Villar. Public Services, Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. 1075, directing the Committees on Agriculture and Food, Health and Demography, and Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the reported entry of uninspected frozen meat into the country in relation to the policies, procedures, and coordination among government agencies on the importation, inspection, distribution, and sale of frozen meat to ensure food security, sufficiency, and safety by Senator Sincha A. Villar. Agriculture and Food, Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. 976, congratulating 15-year-old Marlisa Punsalan for winning X Factor Australia on October 20, 2014, and commending her for being an inspiration to Filipino teens all over the world by Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. B. Nye. Rules. 977, urging the Senate Committees on Climate Change and Environment and Natural Resources to conduct a study and aid of legislation on the affected and vulnerable communities that have been impacted by extreme weather occurrences and the extent of government and private sector mitigation and adaptation efforts given to these areas in the awareness campaign on the matter by Senator Grace Paul. Climate change, environment, and natural resources. 978, entitled Resolution Directing that the Senate Committee room should be configured such that the tables for participating senators shall be slightly elevated over the tables for resource persons introduced by Senator Defensor Sanchaco. Committee on Rules. Communications. Letters from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas transmitting to the Senate copies of the following certified and authenticated BSP issuances in compliance with the new Central Bank Act. Memorandum numbers 2014-036, 37-38, and 39, dated 18-25 and 12 September and 1 October 2014, and circular letter numbers 2014-49-50, Dated 29 and 18 September 2014. Banks, financial institutions, and currencies. Additional reference to business committee report. Committee report number 
prepared and submitted by the Committee on Ways and Means on Senate Bill Number 2437 with Senators Recto, Ra Lapid, and Sonny Angada as authors thereof entitled an act adjusting the 13th month pay and other benefits ceiling ex excluded from the computa computation of gross income for purposes of income taxation amending for the purpose Section 32B, Chapter 6 of the National Internal Revenue Code of 1997 as amended. Recommending its approval and substitution of Senate Bill Numbers 256, 452, 1838, 1944, and 2157, taking into consideration House Bill Number 4970, sponsor Senator Sonny Angara. To the calendar for ordinary business. The Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move that we transfer Senate Bill Number 2426 under Committee Report Number 81 from the Calendar for Ordinary Business to the Calendar for Special Orders. So transferred. With the consent of the Senate, I move that we consider Senate Bill Number 2426 under Committee Report Number 81. Consideration of the measures in order. With the permission of the Senate, Mr. President, I move that the Secretary read only the title of the measure. The Secretary is uh, directed to read the title of the measure. 242 Senate Bill 2426, an act to include ethnic origin in the national survey conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority. So President, I move that we recognize Senator Lauren Legarda to sponsor the measure. Senator Legarda is recognized. Mr. President, our indigenous peoples have shaped our story and history as a Filipino people. Our music, arts and dance, our native knowledge and skills, our deeply held beliefs, our creativity, our sustainable ways of living with our physical environment, and most important, our self-worth. Despite these overwhelming contributions, we have admittedly underwhelmed them as the opportunities, privileges, and rights embodied in the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, or the IPRA, and in other legal instruments have yet to be fully accorded. Carrying out these commitments of IPRA, continues to be a challenge. The governments, the government must have an adequate understanding of our IPs and our ICCs and to be sensitive and responsive to their needs. An entry point to this is having a good grasp of population data based on ethnicity. What is ethnicity? It is a primary sense of belonging to an ethnic group or an ethno-linguistic group. It involves ties, that are reckoned by blood and traced through a family tree. As commonly understood, ethnicity refers to the members of the household's identity of self-ascription as one belonging to a group by blood. Generally, ethnic grouping denotes genealogical and paternal lineage to any of the Philippines' group of native population. It also includes maternal lineage. As such, an indigenous person is anybody whose consanguinity is linked to the parents or any of the two who is a member of an indigenous cultural community. Mr. President, the Episcopal Commission on Tribal Filipinos estimates our IP or ICC population to be between 6.5 and 7.5 million, or 10 to 11 percent of the national population in 1995. It also identifies 40 ethno-linguistic groups. The National Council of Churches in the Philippines estimates the existence of 60 ethno-linguistic groups. The International Labor Organization assesses the total population of the Philippine indigenous peoples to be between 12 and 15 million, or about 15 to 20 percent of the total national population. The International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs calculates about 10 to 15 percent of a total population to be IPs or ICCs, while the Eco Enterprises and Indigenous Peoples has an approximation of 12 million. The population data on ICCs and IPs vary depending on the group handling the research or using the data. This reality compels us even more to obtain the accurate data. In the 2010 National Census, the variable ethnicity was included. It showed that out of a total population of 92.34 million Filipinos, 
IPs or ICCs are estimated to be between 10 and 20 percent. Apart from having data on ICCs and IPs population, there is a need to have a system or a set of relational databases to come up with timely, accurate, and useful statistics on the ICCs and IPs. Such information will continue and contribute to the effective implementation of the IPRA. This proposed Ethnic Origin Act defines ethnicity and indigenous peoples or indigenous cultural communities, which shall be the basis for gathering data on ethnic origin. The Philippine Statistics Authority, in coordination with the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, will employ enumerators or deploy NCIP employees in gathering data on ethnic origin during the conduct of a national survey and national census. In line with this, the NCIP must ensure that these enumerators all over the country, together with the Barangay Indigenous Guides, will have adequate knowledge of the different IPs and ICCs in their area, their language, their way of life, and their culture. They should also know the proper manner of asking them culturally sensitive questions. Being counted gives one an opportunity to be heard. Being counted with one's cultural community gives our indigenous peoples not only the opportunity to be heard, but also paves the way towards development, one that ensures that they are included in the process, their rights are respected, and they are responsible as well. With all these considerations, Mr. President, I call on my colleagues in this August chamber for their support for this important measure. Thank you. Sir President, I move that we suspend consideration of Senate Bill Number 2426 under Committee Report Number 81. So, suspended. One minute suspension. One minute suspension. Okay, okay. <coughs> Ready to resume, Mr. President. Session is resumed. Mr. President, I move that we transfer Senate Bill Number 2437 under Committee Report Number 84 from the calendar for ordinary business to the calendar for special orders. Any objection here in on so transferred? <coughs> With the consent of the Senate, I move that we consider Senate Bill Number 2437 under Committee Report Number 84. 
Any objection here on consideration of the measure is in order. Again, with the permission of the Senate, I move that the Secretary read only the title of the measure. Secretary will read the title of the measure. An act adjusting the 13th month pay and other benefits ceiling excluded from the computation of gross income for purposes of income taxation, amending for the purpose section 32B, <coughs> Chapter 6 of the National Internal Revenue Code of 1997 as amended. So, President, I move that we recognize Senator Sani Angara to sponsor the measure. Senator Sani Angara is recognized to sponsor the measure. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Majority Leader, esteemed colleagues. I rise today as chairperson of your committee on Ways and Means to sponsor Senate Bill Number 2437, as embodied in Committee Report 84, entitled An Act Adjusting the 13th Month Pay and Other Benefits Ceiling Excluded from the Computation of Gross Income for Purposes of Income Taxation, Amending for the purpose, Section 32B, Chapter 6 of the National Internal Revenue Code of 1997, as amended. Mr. President, this bill is a consolidation of five Senate bills with three bills, Senate Bill 256, Senate Bill 452, Senate Bill 1944, filed by no less than our Senate President Pro Tempore, Senator Ralph Recto, who is also happens to be the longest-serving chairman of the committee which I now head, the Committee on Ways and Means, as well as Senate Bill Number 1838, filed by Senator Lito Lapid, as well as Senate Bill Number 2157, filed by this representation. In the House of Representatives, the counterpart measure is House Bill Number 4970, authored by uh, House Ways and Means Committee Chair Miro Kimbo and several other congressmen, which they have passed on third and final reading, Mr. President. Your Committee on Ways and Means conducted three public hearings in December 2013 in August and September 2014 to put the proposals on the table and thereby listen to the voice of various stakeholders from the government and private sectors. My distinguished colleagues, the issue confronting us lies on extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, our fiscal managers are concerned about the potential revenue that our government is poised to forego. As we all know, taxes can support development, enabling government to provide key services. This is the very basis of the social contract between government and its people. On the other hand, Mr. President, the state has the obligation towards its citizens to ensure that social justice is accorded to them, belated as it may be. May obligation po ang Estado sa ating mamamayan na tiyakin na nakakamit nila ang katarungang panlipunan. Mr. President, I am referring to the proposal to increase the tax exempt threshold of the 13th month pay, Christmas bonus, and other benefits, which at present stands at 30,000. Sa ilalim ng kasalukuyang batas at polisiya, walang buwis na pinapataw sa lahat ng 13th month pay, Christmas bonus, productivity incentives, at iba pang binipiso basta't hindi ito hihigit sa 30,000 pesos. Panukala po namin nila Senator Recto at Senator Lapid ay itaas ang ceiling na ito sa 75,000 para mas malaking kita ang maiuuwi ng ating mga kababayan para sa sarili nila at para sa kanilang mga mahal sa buhay. Noong 1994 pa kasi na ilagay ang ceiling na ito sa 30,000, buhat ng RA 7833. Hindi na po ito nararapat sa panahon. Lalo na dahil sa inflation, iba na po ang halaga ng 30,000 pesos ngayon. As a little backgrounder, it was in 1994 through Republic Act 7833 that the total exclusion of 30,000 was legislated. In 1997, under the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program, the ceiling was retained at 30,000, but Congress authorized the Secretary of Finance to increase the ceiling upon the recommendation of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue after considering, among others, the effect on the same of the inflation rate at the end of the taxable year. Unfortunately, Mr. President, this recommendation from the Commissioner of Internal Revenue never came, and likewise, the move to increase the ceiling of the exemption never came as well. The ceiling was never adjusted despite the movements in the consumer price index, the rise in the cost of living. The ceiling was never adjusted despite increases in the legislated minimum wage and basic salaries in both the private and public sectors. The ceiling was never adjusted despite the passage of 20 long years, although a law was passed some years back to increase personal exemptions for taxpayers and their dependents. It is noteworthy, Mr. President, that in 1994, when the ceiling was first legislated, the basic salary of a government employee in the lowest rung of government, or salary grade step one, was 3,800 pesos, 
while that of the President of the Republic of the Philippines at salary grade 33 was 25,000 pesos. On the other hand, the daily minimum wage of a private sector worker in 1994 in the NCR or National Capital Region was 145 pesos a day or 3, 000, approximately 3,100 pesos a month based on 22 days a month. If we fast forward to present day 2014, Mr. President, based on the latest salary standardization schedule, a government employee in salary grade 1, step 1, receives a basic monthly salary of 9,000 pesos a month, while the President of the Republic has 120,000 from previously 25,000. The minimum wage in NCR is now, minimum daily wage in NCR is now 466 pesos from 145 in 1994, and, or roughly 10,000 pesos a month. In other words, even without being promoted, these salaried workers in government find themselves being taxed more because as their salaries rise, the tax exempt ceiling for bonuses, 13th month pay, etc., has remained unchanged. As of January 1, 1995, the 13th month pay of all government officials and employees up to the rank of the President of the Republic was exempt because the ceiling was higher than their basic salaries. As of current date, Mr. President, the 13th month pay of an employee under salary grade 17, step 5, is already above the 30,000 peso ceiling. In our very own backyard, Mr. President, that is at the level of our Legislative Staff Officer 3, or LSO 3, a position which is often given to new graduates who are just applying, who have just applied to, to their jobs in Senator's offices. Republic Act 8424, or the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program of 1997, gave the Secretary of Finance the authority to adjust the 30,000 peso ceiling upon the recommendation of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue based on the effect of the inflation rate at the end of the taxable year. But as I have said, Mr. President, this authority has never been used. But we must note that this authority has been used to adjust the value-added tax thresholds under BIR revenue regulations number 16-2011, effective on January 1, 2012, which increased the threshold amounts pursuant to sections 109P, Q, and V of the Tax Code of 1997 as amended. These adjustments, which were made by the Secretary of Finance, pertain to the sale or lease of real property, sale of house and lot, lease of residential dwellings, and sale of goods and services. This only means that the Secretary and the Commissioner could have increased the 30,000 ceiling if they had chosen to, as evidenced by their action with regard to the VAT or value-added tax thresholds. Mr. President, Article 11, Section 1 of the 1987 Constitution states that public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. And let me add, Mr. President, this modest life is due in part to the take-home pay that has been reduced to the bare minimum because it has been eaten up by income taxes and the high cost of living. As one of our resource persons at the committee level termed it, this is the take-home pay that cannot take the employee home. Your committee is not deaf to the fiscal needs of government. It also recognizes that over the course of 20 years, when the 30,000 peso ceiling was not increased, we did legislate measures that ensured our workers have bigger paychecks, such as increasing the personal and additional exemptions, as mentioned earlier, as well as the exemption uh, of minimum wage earners from income tax. But then, Mr. President, what we are asking today is simply to put the 30,000 ceiling to its present value. Per the Consumer Price or CPI Index data from the National Statistics Office, or the, the PSA now, Philippines Statistic Administration, the 30,000 peso ceiling is worth approximately 82,000 pesos as of August 2014 with 1994 as the reckoning period for this increase in value. Mr. President, my esteemed colleagues, your committee is simply asking that we adjust the ceiling to what was intended by Congress in the 1990s, over two decades ago, or two decades ago. In fact, this, only asks, this bill only asks for an adjustment up to 75,000 pesos. And since the Secretary of Finance has not exercised the power delegated to him by Congress, we propose in this bill that the authority to raise the ceiling in succeeding years shall be vested in the President of the Republic and that the adjustment be made mandatorily every three years to coincide with the major surveys conducted by the Philippine Statistics Administration, such as the Family and Income Expenditure Survey, FIS or FICE, which is done every three years. 
the Department of Finance computes the revenue loss at 43 billion or 39 billion rather using 2011 data that, that uh, it could not substantiate uh, at the last hearing conducted by the committee. On the other hand, the UP School of Economics puts the figure between 1.6 billion and 5.6 billion. Uh, this is the revenue loss, Mr. President. Another expert has put the figure at 2.97 billion. Mr. President, social justice implies fairness and mutual obligation in our free society. The workers toil in order to live. The government taxes the fruits of their labor in order to provide basic services for the workers and their family. Nakasaad po sa ating saligang batas na dapat pag-ukulan ng Kongreso na pinakamataas na priority pagsasabatas ng mga hakbangin na mga ngalaga sa mamamayang Pilipino at palalawigin ang katarungan panlipunan o social justice at karapatang pantao o human rights. Kasama na po dito ang isang living wage o sahod, sahod na sapat ikabuhay. What the government loses on the one hand, it could recoup on the other hand through consumption taxes and taxes or investment. But today, Mr. President, the workers cry out for social justice and the living wage. Pakinggan po natin sila. Maraming pong salamat, uh, distinguished colleagues. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. You. President, uh, Senator Ralph Recto, as I said, the longest-serving uh, chairman of the Committee on Mason and Means, also, who is an author of three bills which were consolidated into this measure, also wishes to deliver, deliver his uh, sponsorship remarks. Sen uh, thank you, Senator Angara. Senator Ralph Recto uh, is recognized to deliver a co-sponsorship speech. Senator Recto. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to my distinguished chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means for sponsoring this uh, committee report. Let me begin, Mr. President. No tax law is chiseled in stone. Revenue laws get amended or changed over time. Economic developments trigger revisions in our tax code. So does technological advancement. For tax laws to be relevant, they must respond to, not resist, the changing social landscape. The only two constants are that citizens obey them, and for lawmakers whom they elected, to change these laws when these become obsolete. Because if our tax code were a fossilized document, then we would still be collecting taxes on opium. A hundred years ago, an opium addict, upon paying the Commissioner of Internal Revenue a fee, as little as one peso, can secure a license issued in quadruplicate, allowing him to smoke, chew, swallow, or inject opium. In 1914, there was also a specific tax on matches. Our first Internal Revenue Code Act, 1189, written under American tutelage, flapped a tax of 40 centavos per 120 sticks. It was also when carabaos were still taxed. So when an addict went on opium den for his regular fix, then he paid a tax on his drug, on the match he used for lighting the pipe, and if he was chauffeured there in Carabao drawn Karumata on his right. Looking back, we may dismiss those levies as novelties. Today, the mere thought of a tax on a match is already incendiary. But at that time, those who wrote those laws saw wisdom in them and the common good they would serve. It is the same wisdom that led subsequent legislatures to prune our thicket of revenue loss of dead parts. The Senate, for one, is a huge paper shredder of antiquated tax laws and even tax proposals. Always it has followed the elevator rule in taxation. Rates can go up or down. The power to tax is not exclusive to raising tax rates. It includes lowering them, not just to impose taxes on goods and income, but to exempt certain ones. And if taxation is compulsion, then compassion lies in the exception to the rule. Exemptions and deductions are what distinguish taxation from taxidermy. Taxation is the art of plucking the most amount of feathers from the goose with the least amount of noise. Taxidermy leaves only the skin. In 1994, those in this chamber, Senator Tito, is a member of Class 92, pondered long and hard on how much of the 13-month pay and other bonuses shall be kept outside the reach of the taxman. 
Republic Act 7833, which they passed that year, placed 30,000 as the no-tax zone. Ibig sabihin, lahat ng ito pwedeng iregalo sa inaanak, anumang lampas, may kaltas na ang BIR. We combed through the debate records to learn how they arrived at this figure. We found out that there were no esoteric economic model models behind the amount. The raison de terre was simple because the salary of the president then was 25,000 pesos a month. Then 30,000 was presumed to be enough to cover all civil servants. The buffer of 5,000 was installed in the event that the public sector pay will be increased. In fact, in, anticipating, in anticipation of this, the 10th Congress included a provision in Republic Act 8424 which states that the Secretary of Finance may raise the threshold. As we all know, in legal construction, there is a whale of a difference between shall and may. The former is mandatory, the latter optional. Often, synonym of may is never. When it came to the 30,000 threshold, the provision to raise it based on inflation was never invoked. Who would have thought that the DOF would love the word may when shall is a favorite word in the BIR vocabulary, as its demand letters are peppered by shall pay, shall remit, shall comply. For its inaction, we are stuck with a threshold carbon dated to one generation, 20 years, and three presidents ago. The peso has lost two-thirds of its value over the past 20 years. One peso in 1994 is worth 36 centavos today. Adjusted to inflation, the 30,000 then should be 82,300 today. But instead of retracing the consumer price index back to the era when the Senate was still squatting in the National Museum, when express mail to senators was called telegrams, when they were summoned to meetings through SMS in their pagers, it would be better to recite grocery receipts then to show how much the peso has lost in value. When the 17-year-old Bam Aquino sipped his first beer in 1994, Pale Pilsen cost eight fifty a bottle. If he rode a jeepney from Katipunan to Cubao, Beer Garden, he paid one peso fifty centavos. Of course, Senator Sunny Angara, on vacation from his London studies then, or I am told that he graduated in ninety four, and if he were to borrow one of his dad's cars, he would have paid eight peso fifty cents for a liter of gasoline. When the other Sunny was an upper class man in PMA, a kilo of rice in the Baguio market was 13 pesos. Bread at Star Cafe can be had at 7 pesos a loaf. When Senator Alan Cayetano was a first term 23 year old councillor in Taguig, his Lakeshore constituents were selling tilapia at 64 a kilo, bangus at 69, and duck eggs at 270 each. At kung go grocery naman si Senator Nancy Binay sa cash and carry noon sa Makati, ang kilo ng baboy ay 86, ang isang litro ng mantika ay 25, ang kalahating kilo ng oatmeal ay 55. Isang kilo ng longganisa ay 85, ang, ang isang kilo ng mangga ay 34, at ang sardinas ay 6 na piso isang lata. Sa Batangas, naalala ko pa na 20 years ago, Pwede kang bumarik ng gin na may kasamang isang platitong mani sa halagang 10 piso. Ito yung presyo ng mga bilihin sa panong itinakda na 30,000 ang 13-month pay at iba pang benepisyong di na bubwisan. Ang 30 mil noon, 10,800 na lang ang halaga ngayon. May ilang nababahala na 42 billion daw ang mululugi sa pamalaan Kung may papasa ang panukalang batas na ito na nagdalayong itaas sa 75,000 ang 13-month pay na di na wibwisan. Wala pong basihan ang ganong pangamba. Una, ang binayad na income sa buong Pilipinas noong 2013 
ay 214 billion lamang. Kung paniniwalaan natin ang ganong haka-haka, ibig sabihin po, ibig sabihin po ba na one-fifth ng sweldo o kita ng mga taxpayers sa bansang ito ay galing sa 13-month pay at Christmas bonus o binibigay kung malapit na ang Pasyo or binibigay kung malapit na ang Pasko. Mahirap naman yata ang paniwalaan yun sabagat numero ang pinagbabasihan sa pagbibwis mas kapani-paniwala siguro ang estimate ng foregone revenue na ibinigay ng PIDS at ni Dr. Stella Kimbo ng UP School of Economics. Tinataya ng PIDS sa 2.6 billion lamang ang kabawasan sa taunang koleksyon at ayon naman sa computation ni Dr. Kimbo na hindi basta namitas ng numero sa ere at sa halip ay ipinakita ang kanyang formula sagad na ang 5.6 billion bilang revenue loss. But whatever is the revenue loss for the government is actually income gained for the working man. And even if his 13-month pay is tax ex exempt upon receipt, it will be taxable when spent. So, not, so tax not withheld at source will later be captured in the form of sales tax at points of sale. This is the season of rising prices of commodities, Mr. President. Yung pork pata na pwede pang noche buena na 63 a kilo nung 1994 ay 170 pesos na ngayon. Yung bigas na tig 13 pesos noon, 42 pesos na ngayon. We can't pass a law prohibiting food inflation as much as we can't repeal the law of supply and demand. Lower price tags can't be legislated. But there's something else we can do to ease the plight of our consumers and perhaps add a little cheer to their Christmas. And that is to pass this law now para mapakinabangan ng ating mga manggagawa at consumer sa Paskong darating. Itong 2014 at sana naman hindi sa 2015 or 2016. In its enrolled form, this bill can be our Christmas card to them. Mr. President, uh, to the Chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, maraming maraming salamat. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rector. Um, Senator Trillanes, uh, what is the pleasure of the gentleman? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll just have a quick manifestation. Sorry? A uh, quick manifestation, uh, Mr. President. Please proceed. Uh, I would just like to manifest that uh, Senator Jingo Estrada, the author of uh, Senate Bill Number 378, uh, be made co-author or, or is the co-author of uh, Senate Bill Number 2436 under Committee Report Number 83 or the Philippine Pharmacy Act of 2014, uh, which um, I sponsored yesterday for the information of the body, Mr. President. Can we consider that, uh, Senator Trillanes, after we suspend consideration of ah. the 30th month may be considered, if you don't mind. We'll call yes, you yes, yes, Mr. President. Mr. President, before we suspend, uh, I move that the sponsorship, co-sponsorship speech of Senator Lapid be inserted into the record. It is now, the copy is now with the Secretariat, Mr. President. All right, the copy of uh, uh, the, the co-sponsorship speech is... Uh, deep read into the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that we suspend consideration of Senate Bill Number 2437 under Committee Report Number 84. Consideration of the measure is suspended. Senator Trillanes is now recognized. Okay. Um, take two, Mr. President. Um, Just for an orderly procedure. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, we'll just, to, we'll just like to manifest that Senator Jingo Estrada, the author of Senate Bill Number 378, is the co-author of Senate Bill Number 2436 under Committee Report Number 83, or the Philippine Pharmacy Act of 2014, which I sponsored yesterday. For the information of the body, Mr. President. Uh, let the co-authorship of Senator Estrada be reflected into the record. Mr. President, I move that we resume consideration of Senate Bill Number 2400 under Committee Report Number 74. This is the Sugarcane Industry Development Bill, Mr. President. 
Any objection? Hearing on consideration of the measure reached in order. Sir President, the parliamentary status is that we are in a period of general debates. Sorry, that the, we have closed the period of general debates. We are in the period of general debates, which I move that we... Give me a minute suspension. Sorry, Mr. President. One minute suspension. Ready to resume, Mr. President. Session is resumed. Sorry, Mr. President. With, uh, upon consultation with the sponsor, I move that we close the period of uh, interpolation. And uh, move we and now take up the uh, individual amendments, Mr. President. The uh, uh, may I seek a confirmation that. Uh, yeah. We are still in the period of interpolation. No, we ended the period. Mr. President, uh, are the gentleman from, uh, from <laughs> Bacolod and Cebu ended the period of interpolation last time. So there is no committee amendment, so we will go to the individual amendments of the gentleman from Cebu and Bacolod. Upon the clarification, let me correct myself, Mr. President. The parliamentary status, we are in the period of... Uh, individual amendments and may we recognize Senator Osmeña to propose his amendments. Senator Osmeña is recognized. Thank you Mr. President. Would the kind sponsor yield? Yes uh, Mr. President we are very happy to accept the um, uh, individual amendments of Senator Osmeña. You are accepting even without <laughs> hearing the amendments? Yeah. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> All right, uh, our first amendment would fall on page Excited. two, line five. Yeah. To uh, delete the phrase, which are five hectares or less. Okay, okay. Uh, we I accept. submit, Mr. President. We accept. Any objection? Hearing none. Approved. The next one would fall on line seven. To delete the phrase, and aggregate, and in its place, to introduce the phrase a minimum. I submit, Mr. President. We accept. Any Mr. Objection President. To none? Proof. The next one is still on line seven to delete the phrase ranging from and to insert the word of, OF. I submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Any objection here and not approve? The next one is still on the same line, line seven, to delete the phrase 250, T-O-50, and in parentheses, the Arabic 50. I submit, Mr. President. Yeah. We accept, Mr. President. Any objection here, not approved? On line 11, at the end of the line, to change or to delete the word of and insert the word by, by. I submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approved. On line 16, same page, after the word skills to insert the phrase training and other. I submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approved. On line 23, to delete the word collaboration and to insert the word coordination, we submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approved. On line 27, to delete the word three and insert the word six, I submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approved. On page three, line eight, to delete the phrase, which are nine hectares or less. I submit, Mr. President. And delete. Delete. We accept, Simply Mr. Delete. President. Okay.
on line 16 of page 3 to delete the word that and replace it with the word who. We submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. On page 3, line 17, to delete the word the and replace it with the word a crop. We submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approve. On the same line, after the phrase until the Insert the word crop. We submit, Mr. President. Same line? Yes. Uh, it will now read, obtain the loan until the crop loan is fully paid. Okay. We accept, Mr. President. Hmm. On page 7... After line 29, after the word, before the word provided, we insert a phrase after colon, after the colon, provided that agriculture land holdings subject to CARP shall, not, shall be ineligible for inclusion in the agricultural, agro-industrial economic zone. We accept, we Mr. President. Approved. On line 24, what to page? delete, on line, I'm, I'm very sorry, on page nine, nine. we go to line 24. To delete the word percent and insert the word rated. So it will read value added tax zero rated. Okay. We accept, Mr. President. On line 26. Oh, uh, any objection? Hearing none approved. On line 26. To delete the word percent and insert the word rated. We submit, Mr. President. We accept, Mr. President. Approved. We move to page 10 on line 16 to delete the word 15 and insert the word 30. We submit, Mr. President. Uh, we accept, Mr. President. <laughs> what's, the, what's the number now? 30? 15. 15. Uh, page 10, uh, 30. 3 0. Double. Instead of, uh, instead of 15. And uh, make it 30. We accept, similar, Mr. President. Similar amendment on line 17 to change uh, 1 5 to 3 0. We submit, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we accept, Mr. President. And uh, that shall conclude uh, our amendments okay. to the uh, Sugar Act. We'd like to thank the good sponsor for her hard work <laughs> and for her graciousness in accepting our amendments. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you from the gentleman from Bacolod and Cebu. Mr. President, there are no other senators who have registered no. or made their intention uh, known uh, to propose uh, amendments, so I move that we close the period of uh, individual amendment. Thank you. <laughs> Period for individual amendments terminated. So, President, I move that we approve on second reading Senate Bill number 2400 under Committee Report number 74. Any objection? Hearing none. Senate Bill number 2400 okay. under Committee Report number 74 is hereby approved on second reading. Mr. President, I move that we suspend consideration of Senate Bill Number 2400 under Committee Report Number 74. Suspended. Mr. So President, I move that we resume consideration of Senate Bill Number 2414 under Committee Report Number 76. 
This is the Philippine Fisheries Code Bill, Mr. President. Any objection here on consideration of measures in order? Mr. President, I move that we open the period of interpolation. Uh, we're closed. No more interpolation. Yeah. Has Maybe any senator reserve? Uh, Actually, Mr. President, after opening it, I was going to manifest that there are no senators. Uh, All right. Uh, the period for interpolation is in order. Mr. President, uh, there are no senators who have made known their intention to clarify or to uh, make an interpolation to the sponsor, so I move that we close the period of interpolation. The period for interpolation is terminated. Mr. President, I move that we open the period for committee amendments. The period for committee amendments is in order. Uh, Senator uh, Cynthia Villar, the principal sponsor, has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, we will uh, be uh, amend. Uh, there will be committee amendments. Please proceed. Uh, number one, page five, line thirteen to sixteen. Delete the whole paragraph and replace it with Philippine fishing vessels, vessels with Philippine waters and high sea, within Philippine waters and high seas, operation operating in violent violation of Philippine regional fisheries management organi organization laws and rules. I so move, Mr. President. Uh, any objection? Hearing none, approved. Number two, page five, line seven to 19. 17 to 19, delete subparagraph B. I so move, Mr. President. Uh, one minute suspension. I wish this chair wishes to clarify Um, with the permission of the chamber, we resume uh, uh, our session. Um, with the indulgence of uh, the sponsor, can she read again the amendment that is proposed by the committee? Okay. Page 5, line 17 to 19, delete subparagraph B. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection? Hearing none. Approved. Okay. Uh, page 7, line 17. Replace the word for with off. I so move, Mr. President. Uh, what, what about lines 20 to 22? We're not yet there. Uh, we, are uh, you deleting this or not? Which one? Page 5, ah, lines 20 oh, sorry. to 22. Sorry, Mr. President. Yes. It's page 5, line 20 to 22. Delete the whole subparagraph C. Any objection? Hearing none, approved. We now go to page 7. Line 17, replace the word for with off. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here and approved? Page 8, line 12 to 23, delete the whole paragraph and replace it with unregulated fishing. It uh, refers to fishing activities in a RFMO area conducted by A, 
vessels without nationality but operated by Filipino and or Filipino Corporation or B, Philippine flag fishing vessels operating in areas managed by RFMOs for which the Philippines is not a party to or in areas where there are no applicable conservation and management measures. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Okay. Page 13, line 15. Delete the words and enforce. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Okay. Page, page 14, line 1. Delete the words bonds. Bonds. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 14, line 1. Before the word fees, add the word reasonable. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 14, line 3. Delete the phrase monitoring and surveillance of fishing vessels. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 14, line 4. Before the word catch, insert the word end. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 14, line 4. Delete the phrase and other services. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 48, line 29 to 30, and page 48, lines 1 to 3, delete section 137 on the rewards to informants and those who assisted in the fishery law enforcement, and uh, renumber the succeeding sections accordingly. Accordingly, I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here on approval? Page 48, line 23 to 30, and page 49, lines 1 to 3, delete the two paragraphs and replace it with a, a fisheries management fund is hereby established as a special account in the national treasury to be sourced from ad administrative fines and penalties imposed under this act and from the proceeds of the sale of forfeited fish, fishing gears, paraphernalia, and fishing vessels. The fund shall be administered by the department of agriculture through the BIFAR. Contributions in the form of endowments, grants, and donations to the fund shall be exempted from donor and other taxes, charges, or fees imposed by the government. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection here in approved. Okay. And uh, retitle the bill to an act to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulating fishing Amending Republic Act Number 8550, otherwise known as the Philippine Fisheries Code of 1998, and for other purposes. I so move, Mr. President. Any objection? Hearing none, approved. Okay. Majority okay. Leader? Close now. That's it. No. This is it. Mr. President, I move that we close the period of uh, committee amendments. Period for committee amendments is terminated. Mr. President. Uh, one minute suspension, Mr. President. One minute suspension.
Okay. Ready to resume, Mr. President. Sessions resumed. Mr. President, there are there's no senators who indicated that uh, they will be proposing um, individual amendments. So I move that we also close the period for individual amendments. The period for individual amendments is terminated. Second reading. <laughs> Sir President, I move that we <coughs> approve on second reading uh, Senate Bill number 2414 under Committee Report number 76. Any objection? Hearing none. Senate Bill number 2414 under Committee Report number 76 is hereby approved on second reading. Congratulations, Senator Villar. Sir President, just some administrative matters. Sir President, I move that we designate Senator Pia Cayetano, Senator Cynthia Villar, Senator Sunny Angara, and Senator Vicente Soto as members of the Senate panel in the Bicameral Conference Committee on Conflicting Provisions of Senate Bill Number 2277 and House Bill Number 4085, both entitled an act establishing the open high school system in the Philippines and appropriating funds therefor. Yes, Senator Angara, and really, are you? <laughs> All right. Ruled, uh, uh, Mr. President. The uh, motion of the majority leader is approved. Uh, with the indulgence of the majority leader, Mr. President, Senator Lauren Legarda uh, told me she wants to be a co-author for the 13th month pay measure. All right. Let uh, uh, the co-authorship of Senator Legarda be reflected. Okay. Sir. <coughs> Mr. President, with the permission of the Minority Leader, yesterday we read the members, uh, we nominated the members of the of the LOVFA, uh, Legislative Oversight on the VFA, and for now for the Minority Mr. President, to represent the minority in, in the Oversight Committee, Senator Vicente Soto III and Senator Gregorio Hanasan II. The membership of Senator uh, Soto and Senator Hanasan into the Legislative Oversight Committee on the Visiting Forces Agreement is hereby approved. And Mr. President, uh, with the permission of the sponsor and author of the 13th month tax exemption bill that the members present be considered also co-authors. The members present are all considered as co-author of Senate Bill 2437. Sir President, a uh, minute suspension. One minute suspension. <laughs> Ready to resume, Mr. President. Session is resumed. Mr. President, Senate Bill Number 332 entitled an act declaring November 20 of every year a special working holiday to be known as National Children's Day, and Senate Bill Number 485 entitled an act declaring November 20 of every year as National Children's Day, had earlier been secondarily referred to the Committee on Youth, Women, and Family Relations, but si since the same is no longer existing, meaning the committee. Upon the last uh, general reorganization of the Senate committees, I move to have the same bills now secondarily referred to the existing Committee on Women, Family Relations, and Gender Equality. So referred. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that we adjourn the session until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, October 27, 2014. Session is adjourned until 3 o'clock in the afternoon of Monday, October 27, 2014.